Okay, Matthew, I'll go back to one of uh, Grant Ferguson's uh, questions again. He's interested to hear your views on closing line value. Um, so I, I don't want to talk about it in terms of like, can you be like, not raw, like the debate around closing line value, it seems generally is, can one be a winning better without having it? So do you need market validation that you're right in order to be a winner long term? Um, I would say that if you're using the exact same methodology as the people who dictate where the market goes, you need to be getting closing line value because by definition, if you're using the same methods, but not getting the same final prices that they're causing, then if they're the ones that move the market, the market's generally reasonably educated over time on average and knows who's worth, whose money is worth most, then chances are you failing. So if you build, you know, if you're, you know, building a, speed ratings because you want to bet at Southern and you know full well that a lot of professional punters who bet on the all weather and like long term Southern, you know, was a classic place to be able to do your own stopwatch work and, you know, get a good speed rating for an advantage. If you're doing that same methodology and you weren't getting closing line value versus the bet fair SB, I'd be concerned, definitely. I'd be like thinking it's unlikely that I have factored in all the elements. It's, what are the likelihood that there are 10 guys who are expert at using speed ratings on all weather and they shape the final odds of that market. What are the odds that I am better than all of them, you know, at doing this? Now, if by contrast, um, you know, you had gone really, really into, say, uh, dosage and you'd be like, okay, I've got this best way of rating, you know, US bred horses, performed better at Southern historically. You know, I don't think those those are considered to be like witchcraft and nonsense by some people. Other people think it's, you know, very good, but it seems to be very out of fashion at the moment. And so from my perspective, it's um, like, what is the chance that all of that information is in the closing line? I certainly would want to give myself a longer spin at that before concluding that I was onto the wrong thing. Um, a great example that, again, Joseph McDowell gave in this book was this tennis tipster that's known on, on Twitter called Nishikori um, and doesn't seemingly have closing line value and yet has made money at pinnacle odds for a prolonged period of time. And the argument I have there is that, well, this, generally the closing prices in tennis will be dictated by people who bet sort of big volume systematically across a lot of matches. And they'll be using very much machine learning or these kind of methodologies to get server percentages they plug into a model that they then create prices etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. now if Nishikori instead is just watching every single bit of tape that's ever been on every tennis player and making up this guy's not you know not feeling it or this guy's not really at the races will that ever be reflected it, it would the only way that that would be reflected is if Nishikori could find him and several other punters who are equally good at this had a massive bankroll between them and they basically crushed the stats men fully out of the market over time that is you know unless he can you know so quite often you know he'll find himself getting closing line value sometimes because you know he's got the same way as the stats men and other times not and people say to me like well surely if he's that good he will impact the market and it's like you know would you rather stake your odds movement on one guy who you can't really understand why he's winning, but you know he's good, or 90% of the body of volume that you're like, well, I know exactly what they do. I've been to their offices. They're smart as you like. You know, there's a good reason that they make money every year. I'm going to have to treat him as the, the cost of doing business and them as the people that shape the market. So closing line value, you know, I would say, a good example again, uh, there was a period where you could get humidity for baseball grounds and humidity was a big factor for totals in baseball. And for a year, the totals seemingly uh, did not respond to the groups who were betting heavily this element and they made a killing and then people found out what it was. So there, there can be no, there can be points for having no closing line value it just means you get to have bigger bets on and you're right. And if you spot those spots, you're really having a wonderful time. Um, you know, so whenever there's something new that comes into the market that people are slow to adopt, I mean, I imagine I, I don't do any in running racing better myself and never have done, but I imagine when the drones first kicked in, there must have been, like, although there's closing line in live is very tricky to calculate, you can ask bookmakers that, 
Um, you know, it's one of those things where a new technology comes in that some people are privy to who are, you know, the market will resist them because they're like, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to resist them because new stuff normally gets harvested by the smart people. And then after a while, they're like, nope, I'm the one getting harvested here. I better adapt and move on, basically. Um, so yeah, CLV, undoubtedly, you know, if you're betting into well-established markets, which are very liquid, and the methodology is pretty much, you know, you can find an infinite number of football papers, you know, English football, you know, about how it's done, how modeling is done. You know, I would say I would almost certainly want at those top levels to get closing line value because, you know, I, it's unlikely that I'm betting into a market where I've come up with something completely new and different. But, you know, would I need to have closing line value on the Winter Olympics going on at the moment? Absolutely not. I would not feel any need to have that whatsoever. OK, now this is from John, who's uh, at BetWinners123. There's a bit of a rant about the, um, we've already covered, you know, the minimum bet example. But he says for go for, it, for go for example, why is it necessary to restrict punters when there's 156 triers all off for their lives? What's the problem? Um, well, the funny thing about golf is you get a better run at golf, actually, than you would do uh, if you're betting horses, that's for sure, or uh, car bookmakers. Um, that I've observed with certain groups at the moment who are betting big, uh, they're definitely getting a larger run out on, on golf. But, you know, I, I would say that there is no reason why you can't find a limit that you can lay everyone absolutely at, you know, give them the same prices and give them the same bet size. No problem. I, I, do, I don't think there is an example. The idea that 100, so 156 tries, it's not necessarily the trying. You know, it's not a question of like, you know, how straight is the event, I suppose. Um, one thing you must remember is that adverse selection plays a huge role here in that you can put up your 156 best prices. You know, you think, I've really got the best effort here. And the you know, smart people will pick out the 10 out of the 156 that you're wrong on. That's, that's just the way it goes. Um, and one thing I will think is that a lot of people seem to think that golf books are more like balanced than they realize. Like I've seen many a golf book with good sized bookmakers, you know, who take genuine amount of golf bets, but it's incredibly concentrated in sort of 10 players. So it feels like you're basically praying for one of the non big backed runners to win. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of shaping books that are very lopsided, I mean, anyone knows, like, I think bookmakers is that in multi-way, so horse racing, greyhounds, you know, golf, if you just have a few bombs sat in the book and everything else is good, it, it's very hard. You feel like you're flipping coins against people at that point. So it's more a case of like, and then people say, like, oh, just push the prices out. You'll get more business. And it's like, it's weird. You know, it's quite often you can push certain players out. And the only bets you'll get is when you push them past some clever model's number, and then you take a bet and you ask yourself, do you want to take the bet? But the idea that you'll collectively push players out and you'll get, you know, Joe Bloggs just having his tenors in, that doesn't happen because people don't tend to bet based on price sensitivity on average. The way to improve the quality of multi-way books for bookmakers is almost as if more people were price sensitive and then pushing a price out would guarantee you some betting, some bets from, you know, Okay. Genuine Joes, I guess. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's it's not it's not I've experience with golf, it's it's not particularly easy. But I, I completely agree, you know, I, I everyone should get the same bet and you should be able to set a decent limit on golf, I think. Okay, now FOG or fog, I'm not sure which it is, is interested in hedging. He says, but do bookies, I'm assuming he means the big bookies like you've worked for in the past, do they hedge into the exchange? Um, which markets are they most likely to hedge on? Uh, I understand that mostly they just let bets run and accept the variance, but are there situations where they will want to hedge more? Well, I assume it means more. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Fogg for his Chrome widget, which is uh, was very good, very nice. A little plug from there. Um, and uh, do they hedge? Yes. I mean, I, I think probably some people have even shown screens of this, but you can see um, on-course bookmakers screens and, there used to be one company that worked particularly with BetDAC. So once upon a time, BetDAC was the predominant on-course bookmakers hedging medium. Um, and that was where BetDAC managed to secure a large percentage of its volume for horse racing. Um, there has been over the recent years, a company that's more linked to Betfair, I believe, um, that has encroached massively, I believe, on the market share, although COVID's been a bit, obviously, on-course bookmaking was a different animal. Um, 
but uh, yeah, there's there's the options. This software generally gives you the options to sort of green up your book or you know adjust your book accordingly. And I think for people, you know, who are you know don't you know don't have many courses they have or many pitches, the ability to reduce the variance because they've got mortgages and families to feed, etc. Um, definitely, on course bookmakers are are hedging into the exchanges, no doubt. Um, big corporate bookmakers. Fine. It depends whether there's ever been a culture of it, really. So I, I, I find it very unlikely that Bet365, I've never heard of people saying that Bet365 has ever hedged anything ever. Um, by contrast, I have heard over the years that um, pre-flutter days, I suppose Paddy Power used to hedge at times, I think, um, particularly large, you know, large liabilities. Um, again, that can just be a case of you know, reducing, uh, reducing, I suppose, annual performance variance. When you get, the funny thing is, is the moment you have shareholders, that's probably the time that you actually benefit most reducing because um, money flows, to getting people to buy your shares, generally you need to have as minimal variance as you can. So in reality, it's the big floated companies that will probably benefit most from it, but the kind of positions they have to hedge those, they'll just get terrible value hedging them mostly. And if there was a company that went to them saying, would you like to hedge with us? You can guarantee that they're not giving them a good deal. So I, I don't think um, outside of small bookmakers, you know, your small online presence, when I say small online, we're talking like a WhatsApp number, a Skype and a, a website with these numbers on it. Those people I'm almost certain will be um, hedging slash following in their customers, this kind of stuff. But um, I think by and large, you know, any any bookmaker that gets over a critical mass, um, yeah, just just doesn't do it. I would say um, offshore in America, so like the Costa Rican kind of um, Caribbean market, there used to be a lot of cross book hedging. I'm not really sure how much that actually goes on anymore, to be honest. Um, but they definitely used to uh, offload liabilities to each other. Um, and in Asia, you kind of got a situation where people would spread. So like, let's say someone hit the market with like a massive position on the team that would end up filtering out across the network, which sort of allowed them all to sort of stay stable and not, you know, no one went to the poor house by themselves, I guess. OK, now this is from Dennis uh, at Carville's Hill. Did your musings around traders on Betfair being the new cannon fodder mean that we should take market fluctuations as opportunities and are the inefficiencies now in the movement of odds right up to the off? And this is referencing racing specifically. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel cannon fodder's harsh, but maybe a, I, I feel always the people who've indulged firstly in, in trading, anyone who goes into Betfair and they have strategies or methodologies that don't require you to know what price you're trading around. So they're purely trading money flow or odds movement. Those are the people who can get caught out worst, in my opinion, because it would seem to me that from what I see is all the best money makers on Betfair, syndicates, groups, whatever, they're trading a bit of the market movement, but they're also trading to a fair set of odds that they've set themselves and they trade around that. Whereas if you're you know, backing a horse that's shortening a lot, you don't know, have any idea in your idea what the price should be, how do you know when you've gone too far or you know you're essentially you are reliant entirely on the money flows the pattern recognition telling you when you're getting value or not and that is that that's not easy i don't think so yes yeah, so canon fodder maybe i think those people are until they learn to be good those are definitely you know and match betters match betters don't care about the price and maybe they haven't priced up what the horse should be they're just like but make a price bigger than bet fellow price you know so so un unpriced not unpriced Price agnostic, I suppose, betting action will always be the stuff that gets beaten quicker, I would say. Um, yes, movement towards the close of horse race. I absolutely do think this. I've got, got I'm not certainly not being able to monetize it myself, but I definitely think there is an element of over move versus, um, I think the sort of the, that late gamble mentality means that and you have to pick it race by race. So I think there's certain races you look at and be like, how much more information can there be available at this point to get into this market that can move 20%, 30% of the price? Um, and there's other races where you can look at and you think there's not been much money matched anywhere. And, you know, it doesn't look, you know, it looks like a low quality race, et cetera. Those late moves, I am probably more wary of. 
Um, but definitely, I, I think, I always think, you know, what's sort of the most uncomfortable bet? The most uncomfortable bet is a big late drifter because you think they've, the instinct is, you know, sadly for racing's, Racing's reputation is that the horse has nobbled somehow, or it's just, you know, they don't think it's going to try or whatever it may be, or, you know, and those are the horses that I, I, I know that I feel awful backing them. So I'm convinced in my mind that, uh, yeah, late big drifters are something which could be a, could be an angle of sorts.